Hi there, David Roach. I want to do something different about Putin's uh, war in Ukraine and talk to you about it. Uh, let's first start with five different time periods going forward. The first is that Russia will get their upper hand in a war of attrition in Ukraine, but neither Ukraine nor Russia of its own volition will gain a massive breakthrough. The reasons for that are to do with OSINT technology, open source intelligence technology, <clears throat> which do, do, do not point to the sort of reserves, even on the side of Russia, to achieve their ambitions. The second is that the result is that Russia will weaken globally. In other words, Ukraine acts as a kind of sponge soaking up uh, Russian resources, uh, removing talent uh, from the, right, the backdrop of the Russian economy, and of course kills an enormous amount of people. But all of this speaks to a declining uh, ability of Russia to hold even its currently reduced place in the world. So although it may uh, hold uh, a war of attrition in Ukraine, that does not mean that Russia is not weakening. It means actually that the war of attrition will increase the rate of the attrition of Russia e economically, socially, politically uh, at an accelerated rate. What this actually means is that as Ukraine does not win this war uh, in the third timeline, the allies, the Western democratic allies, <clears throat> must arm Ukraine to win the war, which is something they're not doing. Tanks are simply not enough. Uh, air defenses are simply not enough. I won't go into all the details of the weapons because there are a lot more competent people than I who will give you uh, a long list of them. But if Russia fights the war in Ukraine to a standstill and gets closer to declaring victory in terms of its ability to hold on to uh, Donbask and Luhansk uh, as regions of uh, Russia, inverted commas, then that is a defeat, not just for Ukraine. Uh, it's a defeat for the Western alliance because uh, Russia could conceivably simply declare victory and go home and say, we've achieved what we want. We've got Crimea, we've got most of Donbass, we've got Luhansk. They're all happily being integrated into the Russian system. And that's as much as we ever wanted, which would be, of course be a gross lie. They're after bringing, the, their objective is to bring down Western democracy, etc. But the West cannot put up with that sort of defeat for themselves, let alone for Ukraine. So the long range missiles, which would allow uh, Ukraine to cut off Crimea and push uh, the Russian supply lines back another 200 kilometers behind the, the front lines of Luhansk and, and Donetsk would be uh, what would happen as a result. So in other words, the Russians getting the upper hand in a war of attrition, which implies stagnation, uh, allows Putin to get closer, at least psychologically, uh, and propaganda-wise to his objectives, it means that the West has to then take the hard decisions which it has not taken already, which is to arm Ukraine to win the war and not just to play a defensive game of war or a defensive game of tennis, which, uh, you know, they come to the same thing. It means the defensive party uh, almost always loses and the costs uh, rise vertically. So, once you get the Western arming of Ukraine to win, and uh, then Crimea gets cut off, uh, Russian supply lines are cut to the front, and you move into a completely new phase of the war. And with it will come Russian response and escalation. Because after all, that is exactly what the West will have been forced to do with considerable delays and thus uh, additional costs. Now, what does escalation mean? Well, there are two forms of escalation. 
lateral and vertical. Vertical escalation means that Russia will use more and more extreme uh, methods, weapons, in its pursuit of war in Ukraine. Uh, that can be cutting North Atlantic uh, cables. It can be using tactical nuclear weapons. It can be uh, using uh, germ warfare uh, and so on. But Russia will escalate. And that sort of escalation is called vertical escalation. The other form of escalation is a lateral escalation. And that, in a sense, <clears throat> concerns two things about uh, the weakening of Russia's position. First of all, Russia could seek to destabilize uh, the global system elsewhere, uh, in Turkey, in Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, in uh, other places in the world, uh, Africa, and so on. That would come as a result of deliberate policy of Russia to escalate laterally. But another form of escalation laterally is coming from Russian weakness. For example, Russia cannot fulfill its obligations, its treaty obligations to either Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, or Armenia uh, versus uh, Azerbaijan concerning the Nagorno-Karabakh because it is too weak to do so. So you can have a lateral escalation coming from either uh, a decision by Putin uh, to spread uh, uh, disorder in the world system to some other theater over which he has a degree of control, or you can get escalation stemming from the fact that the weakening of Russia, which is not gonna stop, will actually create vacuums which will be filled by other players. Now, let me deal with some of those vacuums. First of all, Russia could change its policy on Iran and it could become supportive of Iran becoming a nuclear power with Russian technology to help them uh, for as long as Iran continues to arm Russia with weapons, including drones. Uh, secondly, uh, there can be shifts in Syria. They can come either as a result of vertical or as a result of lateral um, escalation. There is the Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict where Armenia has already refused to really shake the Russian hand because Russia has failed to fulfill its treaty obligations to Armenia concerning the protection of Nagorno-Karabakh. And Azerbaijan, which could uh, uh, sink Armenia uh, militarily, uh, controls the only highway into Nagorno-Karabakh where 140, 150,000 souls live. So Azerbaijan could start a war, which it would most certainly win, and uh, Russia could do absolutely nothing to stop it. The same is, in a sense, true in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, all the stands concerning the battle, the war for water. And then there is Turkey, where we do not know the outcome of the election. We do not as yet know who the opposition candidate will be, but the earthquakes may result in the defeat of Erdogan. And if it does defeat in the, in the result of Erdogan, then we are going to see, uh, we are going to see um, a great deal of uh, disorder in Turkey. Uh, but we are also going to see the result of Turkish power becoming more concentrated on trying to maintain an internal order, even if it is a new type of order, internal order, and the new power which would succeed Erdogan in Turkey is likely to be highly pro-NATO, as opposed to the much more neutral stance, often supportive of Russia's stance of Erdogan. But uh, in places like uh, Armenia, of course, the disorder in Turkey uh, creates an opportunity for Azerbaijan, which Turkey keeps on a leash and prevents from uh, Kind of obliterating, obliterating the Gorno Karabakh, and that 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 sort of control will become much less. So that whole Middle Eastern um, Caucasian map uh, starts to jiggle once uh, if Erdogan was to lose power, and of course, as Russia also. <laughs> then there are two other things to mention. One is Belarus. Uh, I personally think that Lukashenko in Belarus 
Ineos as he is, is clever enough not to enter the war in Ukraine, and that Russia is now too weak to actually force him to do so. So I don't expect a northern invasion of Ukraine from Belarusian, Belarusian uh, territory, and I don't expect Lukashenko to step in on the side of, of, of Putin uh, in this war. So that, in a sense, is a bit of good news. And then finally, there is China. Now, uh, it's, it seems to me that uh, China is unlikely to step up dramatically its supply, support or supply of weapons to uh, Russia, because in doing so, it will alienate itself more from Europe than it is already doing, and it would be backing a loser. So although there's a lot of new noise coming out of the Munich conference, which is kind of a, a foreign policy uh, look-alike to the rich and wonderful, uh, a bit like the World Economic Forum, about which I'm incredibly cynical. Uh, but the noise coming out is that China is about to start uh, to arm uh, Russia against Ukraine. Uh, actually, there's quite a significant uh, number of uh, analytical documentaries which point to China already uh, to some degree uh, arming Russia. And this talk now is coming out of Munich that China is intimating that it's about to do this more. I don't think so. I think China is not going to back a loser to this extent. Now, what does that mean? It means, um, first of all, the deglobalization that will accelerate and the new world order disorder, the new world disorder will deepen. Uh, the idea that markets uh, and economies have unshackled themselves from political risk is untenable. And I would expect equities in particular to reflect uh, the economic, uh, the political realities and the economic instability, which are, are going to flow from the five uh, fold time uh, map, which I've drawn for you uh, progressively as the year goes on. The hedges against the strategic forecast below are of course, oil and grains, both are longs. The Japanese yen will be a greater safe haven than the US dollar. Uh, the major casualty uh, stemming from uh, what I've described are EU assets. And of course, good sovereign quality bonds, uh, although they're not exciting, uh, they are at least defensive. Thanks a lot for watching. This is David Roach.